fireworks outside the Thunder Bay Courthouse today after a not guilty verdict in the trial for a man accused in a 2021 homicide. Good evening and thank you for joining us. A Thunder Bay man was found not guilty of second degree murder today. 33-year-old Dustin Moffitt has been acquitted on all charges in connection with the stabbing death of 16-year-old Cody Furioso in June of 2021. Lee Noonan joins us in studio with the details. Lee? Thanks, Riley. The presiding judge found the Crown had failed to prove their case beyond a reasonable doubt. Moffitt walked out of the courtroom a free man, but soon after that became involved in a heated altercation with a family member of the victim. Friends and family pulled Dustin Moffitt away from a confrontation outside the courthouse with police and family of murder victim Cody Furioso. Moffitt was found not guilty of second-degree murder and aggravated assault in connection to an incident in June 2021 when 16-year-old Furioso and another youth were stabbed. Furioso later died of his injuries. Justice Bruce Fitzpatrick ruled the Crown had failed to prove their case against Moffitt beyond reasonable doubt. Police found Moffitt unconscious near the site of the fatal altercation, and Fitzpatrick leaned heavily on video evidence to support his conclusion that Moffitt had most likely been lying in that same location at the time of the stabbing. Instead, the judge suggested another man, seen on video with Moffitt earlier in the evening, was more likely to be the assailant. Although the surviving victim did identify Moffitt as the assailant in court, Fitzpatrick noted that he also admitted to poor recall of the events and to having seen Moffitt's photo online. The justice also pointed to physical differences between Moffitt and the description given by the surviving victim immediately after the incident. The Furioso family declined to comment and lawyers for the Crown and Defence were not available for interviews. Lee Noonan, TBT News. City Council's first deliberation meeting for the 2024 budget saw a small decrease to the proposed tax levy hike. Council also discussed more money for the public library and the police force, but decided to get more information before making those decisions. Basilio Bellows reports. It was the first opportunity to make changes to Thunder Bay's proposed 2024 budget. It's a very complex budget um, for a very complex corporation. Council's first budget deliberation meeting this year was held on Tuesday, resulting in the proposed tax levy hike before growth, modestly dropping from 6.1% to 6.07. That was thanks to some recommendations from administration approved at the beginning of the meeting, including cost savings from outdoor rink closures and a smaller than expected district social services board budget. The meeting then saw some presentations, including from the Thunder Bay Police Service, which is proposing a $54 million budget. It's a significant contributor to the proposed tax levy hike, with Chief Darcy Fleury explaining how much overtime and understaffing contributes to it. Uh, particularly the last five years, I'd say we've, we've kind of gone uh, on average. We're looking at probably about a million and a half, million, 1.4 on average over the five, last past five years uh, over, over spending on, on overtime. Council was asked to approve $200,000 more in expenditures for the service, but opted to defer that decision until next week. Budget Chair Mark Bentz recognized the substantial police budget and says it will only be cheaper in the future if the root causes of crime are addressed. Funding the police is a quick fix. Funding up front takes longer, but, but you get many times the return in your investment. It's, uh, and people have a better quality of life. The public library's budget was also up for discussion. Councillor Michael Zucino wanted the approval of $150,000 for an outside consultant to look at the library's idea of centralizing its operations at Intercity Shopping Centre. Prudent to know where we're going to be. Um, I think $150,000 spent beforehand uh, is better. Than Council referred the additional funding for the library back to administration. City staff are now expected to bring more information on Thursday for the second of four budget deliberation meetings. Vasilio Spellos, TBT News. The municipality of Shunya will see its tax levy rise by just over 5% this year. Shunya Council met last night and approved the $11.5 million budget for 2024 with the originally proposed tax increase. 
Some costs have gone up with inflation, but Shunya's OPP policing contract has actually gone down slightly. CAO Paul Greenwood adds that administrative costs are expected to drop significantly from $1.1 million last year to just over $870,000 in 2024. The budget also recommends a transfer of $236,000 from reserve funds to keep the tax levy increase at 5.25%. Our priority is uh, always on the essential services for our, for our residents. And so we always want to do you know, uh, more, but our, our focus is on you know, the key services of roads, services, fire and emergency services. And, uh, you know, we always look for the opportunity to do more for our, res for our residents. A nearly 16-year-long project in Ipigan has finally made some major headway. The federal government is awarding a $37 million contract to Finway contractors to construct an administration and visitor centre for Parks Canada at the Nipigon Marina. The announcement comes nearly two decades after Ottawa designated most of the area along the north shore of Lake Superior as a national marine conservation area. The new building will be Park Canada's first ever to be built to net zero carbon standards with a 100-year service life and reduced energy requirements. Once completed, the facility will serve as Parks Canada's primary operations base and visitor reception for the conservation area. Nipigon Mayor Suzanne Kuko says the township has been waiting for this for a very long time. It was October 25th, 2007, when Prime Minister Harper was here at the Nipigon Marina and announced um, the establishment of, of this conservation area. And to now where we're, we're getting a, a, an actual headquarters and a, and a building in Nipigon. So it's very exciting. When we have assets like this, investments from the federal government through Parks Canada, it allows that region to continue to be able to highlight the beauty of the region for visitors and for permanent residents. Construction will begin this summer at the chosen site, which is currently a large parking lot at the Nipigon Marina. The government says the building will be ready to open in 2026. Members of the Ontario Legislature were in Thunder Bay today to conduct provincial pre-budget consultations. The All-Party Committee on Finance and Economic Affairs held public hearings at the Delta Hotel, giving area organizations a chance to voice concerns ahead of the 2024 budget. Josh Morano reports. Party members from the PCs, the Liberals and the NDP listened and voiced their opinions as Thunder Bay stakeholders made their cases for inclusion in the upcoming budget by the Ford government. One of them was the Ontario Network of Injured Workers groups led by Steve Mantis. He believes the WSIB is not helping protect workers and believes a cost shift will make things worse while simply saving the government money. Employers are now paying 30% of what they paid 30 years ago. And as a result, well, why should we invest in prevention? Why should we invest in health and safety if we can get that return on investment other ways? By not reporting, by managing claims rather than managing health and safety. What affected us the most is the claims that does, that does not get reported. And the claims that are not getting reported is mostly by the residents with the second language or underserved and underrepresented people. Up to 80% of claims that are initially turned down are either overturned in part or in full at the appeal stage. So that's very, very significant. And in that period of time, those workers are suffering. Mantis adds a study taken by Street Health in Toronto found that 57% of the homeless people surveyed had a work injury or illness. Poverty Free Thunder Bay also spoke to voice their concerns over the city's high homeless population. The NDP's Terence Kernahan was very involved in the discussion and feels not enough is being done throughout the province to keep poverty from getting worse. You know, we hear uh, that here in Thunder Bay, it, you know, the homeless population is dramatically overrepresented by Indigenous folks. You know, the government has the opportunity to fix this. They have a $5.4 billion slush fund that they could spend on making sure that people had the assistance that they need. But unfortunately, they're choosing to look away. They're ignoring the problems that they have created. Following these budget consultations, the parliamentary members will reconvene ahead of the 2024 budget, which is expected to be announced by the Ford government sometime in March or April. Josh Morano, TBT News. 
Ontario's doctor shortage has reached another alarming level. The Ontario Medical Association says 2.3 million Ontarians now don't have a family doctor. Leah LaRock explains. Alexandra Zanis's search for a family doctor has been exhausting. Yeah, it's a nightmare. Um, I've been on the provincial list, so Healthcare Connect, for about five years. I've, I call out to physicians' clinics. Uh, the most recent one was six years, six years wait list. Without someone to go to, she's waited hours at walk-in clinics or urgent care. You know, six, seven hours on a good day to get into a walk-in, a different doctor every time. And uh, you have to be there 45 minutes before registration even opens. It's a similar frustration for 2.3 million Ontarians who don't have a family physician. The Ontario Medical Association says Ottawa is short 171 doctors, second only to Toronto, short 305. It runs a full gamut. Um, now, the largest proportion of those will be family medicine. In a statement from the Ministry of Health, they say the province has made progress, including adding new family doctors across Ontario and have expanded medical schools, adding hundreds of undergraduate and medical seats, including right here at the University of Ottawa. Those in family medicine say things will get worse, largely because of burnout or retirement. I feel defeated at the end of every day that of the 30 people that I can see in a whole day of 12 hours now, you know, maybe only half of them will get the care that they require. The rest of them will be on a wait list somewhere else. Requiring uh, if your clinic is accepting new patients. Doug Thompson's doctor of 30 years is retiring. Uh, you're not accepting new patients. The former city councillor has had no luck finding a new one. Contacting all local clinics. I think now I'm up to about 15 different clinics. Far away as Cornwall. I'm looking at Arnprior and Renfrew. For Zanis, her hope fading. Oh man, what am I going to do? I don't know. In the long term, like I can't imagine being here if I wanted to have a prospective family and struggling with this. Like I would, I would want to move. Leah LaRock, CTV News. Big opportunities in mining, forestry and energy were highlighted today at the Prosperity Northwest Business Conference and Trade Show. The event was meant to connect communities and industry and set the stage for economic development in the region. Jess Clement has the details. Hundreds of local delegates made their way to the Valhalla Hotel Wednesday for the Prosperity Northwest Conference and Trade Show. It featured over 60 exhibitors, as well as various panels that allowed attendees to share strategies on partnerships and opportunities in the northwestern region. The main focus was on mining, indigenous engagement, and forestry opportunities. It's all about collaboration and working together, as seen between the uh, partnership that was created to, to bring this event forward by the Anishinaabe Business Professional Association and the Chamber of Commerce, right? So that, you know, just in itself, having that partnership Bringing the uh, event forward is also very important. Jason Thompson, board member of the Anishinaabe Business Professional Association, notes that this is the second year the ABPA has co-hosted the Prosperity Northwest Conference. He says the event is a great way to foster partnerships between local professionals, networks and organizations, and set the stage for economic development initiatives and projects. He adds that the event is also a great opportunity for Indigenous business owners. I think it's important too that, you know, for me as an Indigenous business owner that we're also participating in events like this and ensuring that, you know, through the efforts of reconciliation we're being seen and we're also, you know, looking at these opportunities and, and, and taking advantage of the opportunities, right? So that's important for me as an Indigenous business owner and an advocate for the inclusion of Indigenous people. During the conference, the Thunder Bay CEDC announced a collaboration with Fort William First Nation, the ABPA, and the Anishinaabe ASCII Development Fund on a study aimed at exploring the economic impact of Indigenous people and businesses in Thunder Bay. Commission CEO Jamie Taylor says this collaborative study seeks to support the growth and development of Thunder Bay as a regional service hub. Communities are visiting constantly for um, whether or not it be education or health care, um, just general shopping. Um, and we want to be able to quantify that value because we feel that that number is significant in our community and we want to uh, really value uh, to our community what Indigenous uh, people and business are bringing. The study is expected to be finished at the end of the year. Jessica Clement, TVT News. The president of Avalon Advanced Materials was a special guest at an event last night in advance of the Prosperity Northwest Conference. 
The social event brought together stakeholders in various sectors to mingle and connect and listen to keynote speaker Zishan Syed. His presentation focused on making sure local stakeholders understand the external environmental challenges for Avalon's proposed lithium processing site on Lakeshore Drive, as well as what Thunder Bay means for the future of the sector. Syed says he enjoys going to conferences like Prosperity Northwest as it allows him to meet new businesses and make connections. I really like the, the sort of mantra of the conference about being a catalyst for, for connections and in partnerships. That's really been Avalon's MO from day one. Uh, nobody alone uh, achieves greatness or success. And I think that's really the story of Canada. Uh, a lot of different groups come together. We all share a vision, a passion. Uh, we're very energetic for what Canada and Ontario can contribute. The city's council composition committee is holding two more pop-up sessions this week to gain public feedback in the effort to rethink the way Thunder Bay is governed. Committee members stopped in at the 55 Plus Centre today. The six-person committee of local citizens has been tasked with recommending changes to the structure of City Council, which could impact the at-large and ward system and the overall size of Council. The committee wants to find out how residents interact with Council and what they think of the current structure. A survey can be filled out in person or online. Committee members are also available at the pop-ups to talk about the project. I was listening this morning to about four people beside me here uh, talking about the whole thing, like what do they really want? And I thought that's what we want, we want people engaged and that's exciting. We've been to the market so there's a population there that comes. We've been here to, to the 55 plus centre, tomorrow we will go to the uh, city hall. So we're getting di different demographics at each of those and that's what we're looking for is, is people's opinion. Johnson says well over 300 people have completed the survey so far. She hopes to hear from at least five or 600 before the survey closes on Sunday. It's available on the Get Involved section of the city website or at any library branch. A third and final pop-up is happening tomorrow in the city hall lobby between 2.30 and 5.30. As January comes to an end, the temperatures in Thunder Bay continue to rise. We came close to breaking the record of 6.7 degrees Celsius, dating way back to 1892. The warm weather made this the perfect day for people to lace up their skates and hit the outdoor rink at the Prince Arthur's Landing. People from around the city took full advantage of the beautiful conditions down at the marina this afternoon. Everyone we spoke to said they were very happy to get out of the house and go for a skate without having to bundle up or freeze their feet. I think it's perfect because you don't have to bundle up in hats and mitts and you can just come out here in a sweater and have fun. Yeah, yeah it's just nice weather. It's perfect time for skating. It beats being in a sauna, so I come out, it's really warm, surprising. You just wait when the sun comes out, this place will be just packed here. The rink at the marina has an underground cooling system which allows it to remain frozen and in good skating condition, even when the temperatures rise a few degrees above zero. Yeah, and it's a good thing for that cooling, cooling system, system yeah. today because uh, hot weather Haley strikes again. <laughs> uh, the temperature still way above average and way above the freezing mark, Haley. Absolutely. Just as a reminder, our average for this time of year is minus seven for the high. And today we reached a high of four, so not quite the high of six that we were predicting, but still very warm for this time of year. We were under cloudy to mostly cloudy skies, and our coldest temperature of the day was minus six, and that happened around seven this morning. And although we didn't reach what was predicted for us today in Thunder Bay, some areas across the region actually exceeded expectations. In Red Lake, they're currently at four degrees, but their high today was actually seven. And then um, in Kenora, their high was eight today. They're currently at five. Fort Francis was the big shocker today, though. They actually made it to double digits. Their high was 10 degrees today. They're starting to cool down a little, though. They're now at seven degrees. Dryden and Atacokan are both at six degrees. Atacokan saw a high of eight degrees. And then over in our east, east side of the region, Greenstone saw um, a clear sky day today. They are now under clear skies and at one. Marathon is also at one. And then both Wawa and Sault Ste. Marie are at two under cloudy skies. 
for Thunder Bay tonight. We are expecting to drop down to minus three, feeling like minus nine with the wind chill. We're gonna see increasing clouds throughout the night and we have a 30% chance of precipitation and that's gonna transition as it gets colder from drizzle to potentially flurries. And then of course that risk of freezing drizzle will be present as well. So very warm day again today, but now we're looking at a messier evening for the region. I'll have more details on that later though. Okay, Haley, did I hear you correct? 10 degrees, 10 degrees. to the west of us? In I know, in January, double the, digits the in end, January. The end, the last day of January. Yes. Yeah. My goodness. Okay. Thanks mm. a lot, Haley. All right. Well, turning to national news now, there are more than two dozen recommendations that have been made. It comes from an inquest after a former soldier killed three members of his family and himself. We'll have those details and more for you when we return right after the break. It took many months, months to ramp up the care that he so desperately needed. This despite time being of the essence. A judge in Nova Scotia has made more than two dozen recommendations aimed at improving support services to Canadian veterans and their families. The recommendations come after a lengthy inquiry into why a former soldier killed three members of his family and himself. CTV's Annie Bergeron-Oliver has the details. 
After two tours in Afghanistan, Corporal Lionel Desmond came home to Nova Scotia in 2016 a broken man, released from the military with post-traumatic stress disorder and major depressive disorder. Conditions a judge in Nova Scotia said today required consistent and comprehensive mental health treatment that wasn't always there. It took many months, months to ramp up the care that he so desperately needed. This despite time being of the essence. No one person should have a finger pointed at <coughs> The issue is systemic. On January 3rd, 2017, police in Nova Scotia discovered Desmond's body in this home, along with the bodies of his mom, wife, and their 10-year-old daughter. Desmond shot and killed his family before turning the gun he bought that same day on himself. It's hard every year that goes by to think like, wow, like another year is gone and they're not here. Today, Judge Paul Scoville, who presided over the 56-day inquiry into what led to the murder-suicide, issued 25 recommendations, including that the province of Nova Scotia advocate the federal government to have a case manager assigned to veterans transitioning out of the armed forces, that the province update its suicide risk assessment and intervention policy, and that the province provide more comprehensive virtual care to rural African Nova Scotian communities. If these had been in place, back in 2017, it's very likely, I think, that uh, Corporal Desmond would still be alive, his family would still be alive, together and uh, happy. The Veterans Affairs Minister says some changes have already been made. This includes increased case management services, more robust mental health supports, and a redesigned transition process. One of the recommendations is to create an implementation committee with a five-year mandate to ensure that today's recommendations are put in place. Annie Bergeron Oliver, CTV News, Ottawa. Turning to the Middle East now, Hamas says it's studying a new proposal to pause, pa to pause fighting in Gaza in exchange for the release of more hostages. The proposal reportedly has three phases and includes major deliveries of humanitarian aid to Gaza. Washington says it hopes negotiations will lead to an extended pause in fighting, one that's longer than the one that was brokered in November. We are looking at uh, an extended pause is the goal. How long? That's all part of the discussions, but longer than what we saw in November, which was about a week. We'd like to see a longer pause than that. Not just because that helps facilitate the movement of so many more hostages out. You can get more people out if there's a longer cease and a longer uh, stoppage in the fighting, but so it can also give us an opportunity to increase the flow of humanitarian assistance in. Kirby says progress has been made in the negotiations, and Washington believes discussions are moving in the right direction. In Washington, social media executives are being grilled over child safety. Lawmakers are accusing the tech leaders of failing to protect kids from exploitation and abuse. Mr. Zuckerberg, you and the companies before us, I know you don't mean it to be so, but you have blood on your hands. You have a product. You have a product that's killing people. Republican Senator Lindsey Graham says it's time to repeal Section 230. That's the federal law that protects websites and social and we media platforms from lawsuits arising from user-generated content. Parents of children who were harmed online were in the hearing room. At one point, a senator called on Meta CEO Mark Zuckerberg to apologize to them directly. Would you like to apologize for what you've done to these good people? I, 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 I'm sorry for everything that you have all gone through. It's terrible. No one should have to go through the things that your families have, have suffered. And this is why we need to stand up. The chairman of the hearing called you online child exploitation a crisis fueled by sure rapid changes in no technology that give that predators powerful special. new tools to target kids. Well, perhaps now we need this next story more than ever. It's always good to hear from an old friend who just wants to check in. Well, Elmo checked in with the Internet, and thousands of responses from T-Pain to the President of the United States were emotional. ABC's Will Reeve has the story. Oh, Elmo! Elmo's so happy to see you! You're Elmo's friend! Elmo really loves friends! It started as a simple question from one of America's most beloved characters. Elmo taking to X to ask, how's everybody doing? With nearly 200 million views and tens of thousands of replies, the earnest question unleashed an avalanche of responses from so many dealing with difficult issues. 
Men and women from all over writing in with statements like, Elmo, I'm suffering from existential dread over here. And every Monday, I cannot wait for Friday to come every single day and every single week for life. Fresh off a heartbreaking Lions loss, the Detroit Free Press speaking for many, saying, we've been better. Rapper and singer T-Pain adding, I'm just looking for somebody to talk to and show me some love if you know